Hey guys, welcome. It's good to see you back this week. Uh, got some new faces too, so it's good to have you for Family Matters. Uh, this is something, as we talked about last week, I'm very excited about this study that we're going to do throughout this semester, looking at all kinds of things uh, from relationships uh, within marriage, but also just great principles for relationships in general. So we are here in a couple of weeks. Let me just make this disclaimer. Here in two weeks from tonight, we will start about six weeks where we are really looking at marriage. Uh, and it's going to be great. It's going to be wonderful. We have spared no expense. We have brought in the foremost experts on marriage that we could find, um, and they will be here with us for, for the next six weeks. Uh, Rick and Sue Hugler are going to be leading us. But I also want to say something um, in relationship to that. I know that there may be a tendency or a temptation to say, well, I'm here tonight, I'm not married, so those weeks on marriage, I'm not gonna come because it might be awkward if I was here. Can I tell you, please go ahead and come because what we're gonna talk about, these are building blocks. These are great principles for relationships. We're talking about conflict. We're talking about roles in relationships. We're talking about some really important things that are good. It's a good investment for you, right? whether you are married, whether you're not married. So don't let that be a hindrance. Come on out for those weeks um, because as we go through those weeks, there are other great just gospel truths that we're gonna discuss, principles that are gonna be so important for, for your family unit. Um, so please come on out for that. Don't let that keep you away. Um, I wanted to make sure to just stress that. Um, we do wanna talk about marriage. It is, it is a foundational relationship that we've got to talk about, um, but we want everybody to be here for that conversation. There's a lot that we all can learn as we go through that conversation. Um, and next week, I need to make one reminder to you about what next week is about. We've got a ministry with us called Be Broken. Uh, they are based out of San Antonio, and they are going to be with us as a follow-up to this coming Sunday's sermon where we are looking at what Scripture says about sexual purity. And so this organization is going to be with us. Uh, there's, a, there's a man and a woman that are going to be here with us from, from Be Broken, and they are going to do quite a few things in that evening. They are going to talk about how we put up health, healthy guardrails in our lives personally, in our families, to protect ourselves from those temptations, from the tendency toward addiction in that area of pornography and sexual sin. They're going to talk about healing and hope if that is something that you struggle with. It is, it is prevalent, it is common, it is things that is, is so in our face, all through in our society. So this is an important topic. And so please, I don't want, here's the, the tendency, I don't want to come next week when that is the topic because if I'm in the room, people are going to assume things about me that I don't want them to assume, right? Let's just go ahead and call out the elephant that's, that's in the room. So I'm not gonna show up next week. Please come out. We all need to hear this because we are all exposed to this. We are all subject to temptation in these areas. So to hear about how we put healthy guardrails in our lives and, and ways that if that is a struggle, that God, through the gospel, gives us freedom and and. And, and brings us, breaks those chains in those areas, it may be great information for you to be able to help someone else. Um, there's gonna be a way to submit even um, anonymous questions that you can have um, Dan and, and Julie, who are gonna be with us, at answer. They, they're, gonna, they're gonna take some time to do some Q&A, so you can submit those questions. Um, like I said, anonymously, they're gonna have resources available. Uh, so it'll be a really good night that I think will be really, really helpful. Uh, so that is next week. And then after that, we jump in uh, for, for several weeks then with talking about marriage, talking about parenting. So that's kind of a preview of where we're headed tonight. Let's pray, and then we are gonna jump into kind of the remainder of laying this foundation that we talked about last week, okay? Father, we pause right now just to say thank you for this time that we have to spend together. 
Uh, thank you for each person in this room. God, thank you for their, God, their investment in, in their family uh, to be here, to just get into your word, um, to understand, God, what it is that your word says to us about our relationships, about who we are, and God, about how we can have families that glorify you, and God, how we can, we can live the way that you have designed us to. Um, so God, I pray that our conversation tonight uh, would glorify you. God, it would be helpful and encouraging in, in our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, Pastor Jason is obviously not up here tonight. He got an opportunity that he needed to take advantage of to go with his oldest son uh, for some father-son time. So they are doing that this evening. So you're stuck with me by myself tonight, but we're gonna have a good time. Uh, we are gonna finish up our conversation looking at just the sure foundation that we need to lay. We started out last week by saying we need to lay some foundational principles that the gospel gives us that are going to pop up all throughout the next 15 weeks or so. So we started that last week. We're gonna continue it this week. Last week, our focus was very much on who is God? That was, that was where we start. Who is he? What is he doing? And I said this week, we were gonna look more at our identity because of who he is who are we in relationship to him? But before we get there, I want us to go back to a passage that we just briefly touched on last week. So if you've got your Bible or if you just wanna look in your notes, look at Romans chapter one, verses 21 through 23. Listen, I'm gonna read this out loud, but I want us to, to pause here for just a minute and think about these verses and what they say to us. Paul says, as he's writing, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things." So what you see in this passage is a progression that is not moving in a healthy direction, we would say. It says they, they knew God, they had an idea, but it says, what did they do? They didn't honor him as God. They, didn't, they did not recognize him for who he was. And so what happens? It says they became futile in their thinking. You see the progression? But in their futile thinking, what do they believe about themselves? Verse 22. Audience participation. What do they believe about themselves? That they're wise. But what is the reality? They're fools. Why are they fools? It tells us in verse 23. What did they do that was so foolish? Yeah, they exchanged the glory of God for a cheap imitation, we would say. So this, this is a reality that, that we've got to get our minds around. And this is one of those that we don't like to do because it tells us things about ourselves that we would rather not believe. That left to our own devices, apart from Jesus, we are, verse 22. We think we're wise, but, but we are fools, right, apart from from Jesus, and that is a reality we've got to understand. But look at where it starts. It doesn't start with them. It starts with what they were believing about God. And so that's the first point I want you guys to see, even from this text, is that because we believe lies about God, it means we also believe lies about ourselves. Our, our nature as, as sinful, fallen human beings you know, one way we could phrase that, one, one theologian says that we every day in ourselves try to de-God God, right? We wanna take him off the throne and we wanna place ourselves on it. That's what the Romans passage we just read is talking about. And so that is our tendency, right? And, and we believe these lies about God that, that we can do that, that somehow God is there for us to manipulate 
for us to just use for our convenience that he is not holy, he is not righteous, he is not sovereign, he is not the supreme authority of our lives, that he is just there for us as like a, you know, we have all these different God views, that he is like this cosmic grandfather that I go to, you know, to, to get something, or he's there as a bellboy. If I, if I need something, I, I run to God, right? We have these wrong ideas. We believe wrong things about God. We have a tendency to do that. And when we do that, it doesn't stop there. It trickles down and it ends up, we believe wrong things about ourselves as well. So we need to be reminded of that. We need to know that. We also need to know something else about ourselves. And this is something we're gonna talk about through the night, so I wanna go ahead and just give this to you up front that many people don't know how to distinguish what they feel and experience from what they actually believe. And we're gonna talk about what that means in just a little bit, but basically what we're getting at here is our feelings become the truth. If we feel it, it must be true. We're guided, we're, we're led by our feelings. How would we say that? How do we hear that said in our culture today over and over again? I'll give you the first word, you fill it in. Follow your, yeah, what is that? That is being led by my feelings. Well, if I feel it, that must be right. So it's hard for us. And it's, I would tell you, it's impossible outside of the word of God, the truth of God's word, to be able to distinguish, right, these things that we feel, these things that we experience from, act, from actual truth. Even as believers, there, there's a book that some of this content that we're looking at tonight um, comes, comes from. It's called Gospel Fluency. We've mentioned it before. Uh, the, the author of that book says this, even as Christians, right, deep down, we believe the truth of the gospel. We believe that God sent his son, that he came and he took our place. He was our substitute because we were sinful and could not save ourselves. So Jesus took our place. He took our sin. He gives us his righteousness so that we can be reconciled to him and have a relationship with him. We, we know that. We believe that is true. But our feelings and the things we experience in life sometimes cloud what we really believe and we get led to where we forget the reality of that truth and we start living as though other things are true. That's what we mean by that phrase there, that sometimes it is hard for us to distinguish our feelings from the truth of who we are in Christ. So we wanna get to the root of that and deal with that tonight. And this is is that last statement there, just saying it another way, trying to help us think through it from, from a lot of different angles tonight, is that we need to deal with sinful beliefs, or we would say the root, of of these things in our lives, because that root is what produces sinful behaviors in our lives or fruits. So as we start to think about relationships, as we think about relationships with our spouse, right? We think you could, you could even say relationships with your kids, kids with their parents, right? Friendships, whatever relationships we're talking about. As we think about those, right? We would say, I sometimes see bad fruit, strife, um, stress, anxiety. We, I see bad fruit fruit. But what we need to do is say, well, if there's bad fruit, then there's, there's a root issue that we need to look at and we need to address. And so that's where we want to go tonight is how do we get there? How do we begin to use the word of God to help us identify where the real issues are in our lives, right? If there's an issue in our marriage, right? Let's, let's make sure, let's get to the root of the problem and let's talk about that and let's go to God's word to deal with that, right? If we're struggling with our children and how do we lead them? How do we, how do we bring them up? How do we deal with behavior issues, right? Or strong wills or all those different things. How do we deal with those things, right? We could be just looking at like a, a, a behavior and we just, we just focus in and drill in on that one behavior, but we know deep down for each and every one of us, there is a deeper 
heart issue that, that we've got to deal with, and that's this right here, right? Because of our sin nature, we all have a natural tendency toward identity idols. And that's where we're gonna actually start tonight is looking at what are some of those things, right? Last week, we talked about the truth of who God was. We had to lay that as part of our foundation. But in knowing who he is, that defines who we are, our real identity. It is rooted in the truth of who he is. But too many times because of our sin nature, we will look to other things to tell us who we are. We look to other things to give us worth and value, to define us. And the Bible would call those things idols that we look to for our value and worth. If we were to continue on in that passage in Romans, when we get to verse 25, look at what it says. Because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, Remember what we just read? They, they, they worshiped and served the creation rather than the creator. So because they did that, they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever, amen. Right, it's a worship issue. When we think about what we look to for our identity, what we look to to, to tell us our value, our worth, who am I to answer that question? When we look to anything other than Jesus Christ to, to determine that, the Bible says we've got, a, we've got a heart issue and even more than a heart issue, we've got a worship issue. We are looking to something else to fulfill a need in our life that only God can fulfill. And so one of the important things for us to do in, this, in, in tonight before we start moving into looking at specific relationships and getting tools for how to, how to help us in those, is to say, let's examine our lives to see if there are idols where we have, we've had maybe wrong, a wrong understanding of who God is, and it's led to a wrong understanding of who I am, and maybe I've been looking to other things to, to meet needs and to fill voids in my life, to give me value and worth, and I should have been looking to Jesus. So if we can deal with some of those things right here at the, at the outset of our conversation, it's gonna make our conversations about specific areas of our lives so much more productive. So I want us to do that. But before we get there, before we start looking at some of these idols, I want you to take a minute. I know we're at tables and we're gonna do some group discussion in a minute, but I want this to be a, a, just a solo exercise here. I want you to take just a moment. I'll give you like three minutes. And I want you to just think about your own life for a minute and answer this question. What things other than Christ have you looked to in the past or maybe have a tendency right now to look at to define you? What would you say if you were just thinking that way, like what are the things that I look to to give me identity, to tell me who I am? What are those things maybe I look to other than Jesus? What would you say some of those might be? Just write them down. Just for, it's just your, for, you know, this isn't something to share around the table. This is just for you. Take two or three minutes to think about that before we keep going, okay? I'll tell you when we're done. All right. If I were to let you look on my paper and you could see what I wrote in that blank, you would find that I would say one of the things that in the past I have been prone to look to, to give me worth, to identify me, that even now I have a tendency to do, is pleasing people. Like I look to, like I struggle. That is an idol in my life, is looking to, like I need people to be happy with me. I look more toward the approval of man many times in my life more than anything else. Like to me, that defines me, right? If somebody is upset with me, if I don't think I've met an expectation, um, then I feel like a failure. If, if, I, if I think I made someone unhappy, right, then, I, then there is something 
flawed in me and my identity, and I feel less than. So that, that's one of mine. That's just being very real. Like, that is one that I have to fight against is the, the, the approval of man is an idol that I can run to for my identity, right? And I'm sure you've, some of you may have the same one. Some of you may have written down other things, but we all have them. And I want us to take a few minutes now as we turn the page. There is a really helpful acronym here with idols that I want us to look at. I did not come up with this, but this is, this is actually really helpful to categorize for us some of the bigger buckets that maybe we look to for our identity. So you ready for these? Let's work through these here and think through some of these and see if, if any of these resonate with you. And like I said, this may make us a little uncomfortable because you may say, ouch, I don't like it when you pick on me. Uh, I don't, I don't want to think about this and I don't want to, I don't want to be reminded that that's true, but, but it is. So for some of us, so as we think through this, the I in idols, that represents one bucket for us. That would be sometimes for our identity, we look to items to identify us. You've got some examples of that there in, in your handout that won't be up on the screen. We might say it this way. If this is an idol for you, you might say that what we own is our way of expressing our identity. Consumerism. We buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't know. You know that that is an idol, right? If you say, ouch, that is, that is something that I do. Like, I need people to see, you know, that I've arrived, right? I've got the most stuff. You know, the, the, the one with the most stuff wins, right? So stuff, if I have stuff, then that makes me valuable, my identity is wrapped up in what I have. So what is the negative there? If we don't have the latest and the greatest, then what do we start to believe about ourselves? That's right. If I don't have what my neighbor has, yeah, then, yeah, then I'm behind. There's something wrong with me. Do what? Yeah, fear of missing out. That's right. So items is, is one of those, and, and I think it's very, you know, very prevalent in, in our culture, in America, that, that idea of consumerism, right? We will, we, will, we will add problems, and we're gonna talk about this in, in a few weeks. It's a few weeks down the road when we look at possessions and how we manage money, Right, we get in trouble as I don't want to steal the thunder of our of our of our team presenting uh, when we talk about money. But but we but when our identity is wrapped up in stuff, right, we will get our we will put our families in even more stress and more tension to get more stuff, and we just create more problems when our identity is misplaced and it's in items, but there's other places, right? If that, you say, whew, that's not me, right? Uh, so I'm off the hook. I don't have any identity idols. Oh no, we got four more letters. So you, you may, you still got some they will, that you'll fit in here. The next letter, the D. We got any firstborn kids in the room? Any, any firstborns in the room? Any firstborns feel like it was that, you know, what you did is what defined you? You had to be responsible. You had to take care of everybody, right? It was up to you to be the mature, responsible one, to take care of all those immature, bratty siblings of, of yours. Oh, wait a minute, that's me. That's not you. Um, I'm an oldest, this is, this is one for me. But look at that, life, we might describe this, life is filled with duties that can rightly be a way we worship God. Is it good to do right things? Is it good to be responsible? Is it good to be hardworking? Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. Is it good to, to sometimes go the extra mile and help somebody out? Oh, yeah, it's wonderful. That's a way to be Christ-like. But, 
it can wrongly be a God that we worship. When our motivation for what we do is to show people our value, to get our worth from it, rather than looking to God for our identity, and we look to what we do to define us, that becomes an idol. Do we do that in our jobs? Men and women, do we look to our jobs to define us? Right? I'm, I'm gonna, I've got to pursue this career and I've got to sacrifice time here and time here because if I do this, then that's gonna show people just how important I am. Duties, when that's an idol, they become a search for something to outperform others, to demonstrate that we're superior. When at all cost. But what happens when we don't, when we don't win, when we can't outperform everybody else around us, when we can't get the promotion, what happens? I've given you an example here, but you know, right? You don't even have to read the paper, right? It can lead to just devastation, feeling like a failure, depression, why, why was I not good enough? Why did I get passed over, right? Why did somebody not recognize what the hard work that I did, right? It may not even be your job. It may be you were helping someone out that needed something, but maybe they didn't thank you like you thought they should thank you, and it just devastated you, right? Sometimes we are, that, that's an idol. It's like, I'm gonna do certain things because that's where I find my worth, all right? So anybody that's still off the hook, right? These two, you know, like, why are we even talking about these? You're wasting my Wednesday night, Daniel. Keep, keep going, all right? How about this one with the O? Others. Oh, now this one will pop up over and over and over throughout the next 15 weeks because most of what we're gonna talk about in our Family Matters class is relationships. And relationships are a source of identity idols in our lives. Now, first statement here, did God make us for a relationship? Absolutely, that was good, that was good and confident. I liked hearing it. All right, Genesis, God looks at Adam and what does he say? It is not good for the man to be Alone, we are made for community. We're made for friendship. But this good thing that God made us for can honestly become, a, just like the others, a God thing in our life. We can start looking to people to meet a need that only God can meet, to, a, to, to define us. And you, you see some examples here Right, our identity gets wrapped up in our tribe, right? That tribe, the people we, we belong to, that we look to for identity, it can be based on all kinds of things. You see that list there? Family, school, sports teams, race, gender, culture, your income level, hobbies, political parties, and a hot one in our culture today, even your sexual orientation, right? How you define yourself, how you group yourself sexually can even be a way that you look for, for identity. Now, some of that, some of those, there is nothing wrong with finding camaraderie with people that have shared interests with you, correct? Right, any Tennessee volunteer fans in the room? I got a couple. <laughs> I knew I did. That's why I said it. Ha! I got you. I got you. See, there is nothing wrong, right, with me being able to look out in this room and just to know that there is the few, the proud, the, the faithful who have suffered through several years of agony, right, to stay true and loyalty to, to cheering on the volunteers. Right? There's nothing wrong with that. Any Baylor Bears in the, in the house? 
You thought I was going to say Aggies, because that's the one we always go to. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go, I said it, I, I still got it. All right, right, we do this, right? We, we have loyalties, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with saying, you've been where I've been, right? You've walked on Tennessee's campus like I have, right? You, you wear orange and white, right? And you get made fun of saying, oh, is that your Whataburger costume, right? I mean, it, it's, you, there's a shared camaraderie there with those experiences, and those are okay, and those are good things to have. Maybe it's around a music group. Maybe it's your family stage of life, and you've got some friends that you've made that are in that same stage, and it's like, oh, that is sweet. Like, there's friendship here, and, and we, can, we can share uh, <laughs> war stories about sleepless nights and, and, and messy houses and, and all the things, right? Th- those are all fine things for us to find community and and friendship in, but even a good thing like that, that when that becomes what defines us, it, it it can become a God, it can become an idol in our life. And here's how we know we're getting there with those things, this next bullet point. When we are willing to change our appearance, our behavior based on whose approval and whose connection we are seeking to have. You ever been there? Or we see this in teenagers a lot, and we like to pick on teenagers for this, don't we? That, that they will, we call it peer pressure, that they will, they will just become somebody completely different because their whole world is wrapped up in who accepts them and so they will change and, and morph into whatever they need to to be accepted by this group of people. But we're in a room full of adults. So surely that's not a temptation for us, is it? It is, if we're honest. We, we still are, are, can be prone to doing this. leading us to fulfill our need to belong, to be liked, to be desired, right? More than anything else, right? People can become idols in our lives. Ready for the next one? Giving you plenty to think through right now? Maybe too much? Longings is the L. Longings, better future, oh, maybe tomorrow, right? If I could just get there, then my life would be complete. Right? I'm in high school. If I could just get to college, man, life would be sweet. If I can just graduate college and get that job, oh, that's all I need. If I could just get married, that will solve all my problems, right? If, if, if I just have a family, if just start a family, and you know, and he's like, oh, wait a minute, no, no, that just creates more problems, right? No. Um, but longings, when our lives become consumed with the thought that tomorrow might be better, we're governed by our feelings and what the future holds rather than living in the present moment. Our hope and our identity gets wrapped up in whatever those longings are. Here's some examples, right? If I could just feel better, right? I gave you some of these other ones. If I could just get this promotion, right? If I could just, if I could just get my income level, if I could just get this much money in the bank, if I could just get to this next season of life, all my problems would be solved. And I finally would be the person I'm supposed to be. I'd have the identity that I've been striving for. You ever get caught up in that? Long, like just all of your longings, right? That, that is what it's, you're just always looking ahead. I wanna get to this next thing. We're never able to just rest in the moment in the season where God has us and, and, and experience what he has for us in that moment because we're always looking for that next thing, right? That, that can be an idol in our lives, And then the last one, the S. Sometimes our identity actually gets wrapped up in our sufferings. 
painful things we've gone through, scars that we have, struggles that we faced. Now, in this room tonight, there's, I haven't counted, there's, I know there's over 50 people, so probably somewhere between 50 and 75 people in the room tonight. In this room, of 50 to 75 people, there are 50 to 75 stories that could be told of the results of living in a fallen, sinful world and the way that you have personally dealt with suffering in your life, right? We, none of us escape it. None of us get through life without dealing with heartache and struggles and pain, rejection, loss, sickness. We, we all face it. It is the reality of the fallen world that we live in. But here's the thing. If we're not careful, that suffering can actually become an idol as, as kind of uh, counterintuitive as that sounds. It really can. How we suffer can actually become our identity. Our worst day, our greatest suffering, our deepest loss can so mark our lives that it becomes how we view ourselves and then how we, how we almost, to protect ourselves, we want everybody to see us that way too. We just go ahead and throw up walls and, and, and put it that way. All right. Um, yeah, that's right. Got, got, yeah. Um, I like this statement. Our sufferings may help explain us, and that's okay, right? The things that we've gone through can help us see the world differently, and sometimes that's a good thing, right? The wisdom that comes from walking through trials and, and coming through them and God bringing you through them, they can help us. They can help explain us, but when they define us, they've become an idol, right? You are not your suffering, right? You are not the scars, right? You are not your past mistakes, right? So when our sufferings become the thing that define us, then they have become an idol in our lives. So you've got there five big bucket categories of idols that I would feel pretty safe to say that each of us in the room could say, at some point in time in my life, maybe today, I have looked for identity in one of these things rather than looking to Christ to define me. So what I want you to do, I want you to take about five minutes. You've got three questions there. I want you to circle up at your table. If you're at a table with just one or two people, jump in with another table so that you've got people to talk to. And I want you to use those three questions just to have some conversation to kind of wrap up this section talking about identity idols, okay? So take about five minutes to do that, and then we're gonna jump into this, the second half of what we're gonna do, okay? Well, okay. We'll have another time for conversation here in just a few minutes, but let me move us forward from looking at identity idols to thinking correctly about our identity with just some statements. Now, these are not things that we're gonna have time tonight to, to dig into. I would tell you last week, so you have this in your notes, Pastor Jason looked in Ephesians at who we are in Christ. Remember, he took, if you were here last week, he took us through that passage of scripture and we saw that we were chosen, we were adopted, we have an inheritance. All of those things about who we are in Christ, right? That is, that is the root, that is the foundation of our true identity. So I'd encourage you, go back and meditate on those scriptures. Some of these things that I'm gonna just read you, you've got some fill in the blanks on page 14 that we're just gonna go through. We're not gonna have time to unpack these, but I wanna give them to you. And then maybe go back and just think through these a little bit more. Think through how scripture shows these things to be true uh, and help, to help us think correctly about identity. So here are these statements. Let's just go through these so you can fill in your blanks 
as we, as we continue to, to move from idols to thinking right about identity. When we think about identity, our tendency is often to think in terms of biography. Where's the focus if we think about our identity in terms of it's, it's my biography? It's about, it's about me. Scripture gives us a better way to look at it. Scripture teaches us to think about our identity in terms of our testimony. If you were to share your testimony, who, where is the focus? Come on, shout it out. Yeah, it's about what he has done. It's about who you are because of what he has done for you. So the story is all about him. So many times we think that our activity determines our identity. But scripture actually teaches it's the exact opposite. Our identity determines our activity. What we do is an outflow of who we are, or I would say what we believe about who we are. So the absolute worst place you could begin when you're thinking about your identity and you wanna think about who am I, the worst place you can begin to build that is with yourself. The best place to begin is with Christ. And I would tell you that as we think about our relationships, as we think about what God has called us to be as husbands, as wives, as parents, as friends, if our identity is not rooted in who we are in Christ, Right? We, we will not have success in those other relationships in our lives when this relationship is not, is not absolutely secure and settled. And we'll see why as we go through these weeks. It's, it becomes very apparent, but we need to stop and just be grounded with this thought. We live from our identity not for our identity. Same, same thing we said a minute ago, right? That our that our identity determines our activity. This is just saying that same thing another way, uh, that we live from our identity, not for our identity. And why is that true? Because the gospel tells us, right? We're looking at all this from, a, from the gospel's perspective. Why, is, why do we live from our identity, not for it? Because we, as followers of Jesus, are defined, we are defined by who we are in Christ not by what we do or fail to do for Christ. That passage we looked at last week in Ephesians, all of these spiritual blessings that we have, they are not ours because we were good enough. They are not ours because we worked hard enough. They're not ours because our good deeds outweighed our bad deeds. They're not ours because we we somehow earned God's approval. They are ours because he gave them to us. They are a gift of grace that he gave us that cost him his son, right? Our identity comes at the expense of the shed blood of Jesus. Just think about that for just a minute. For you and I to sit here tonight and be able to celebrate the fact that our identity is rooted in who we are in Christ, not what we do. That is not a flippant thing that we say, right? That comes at great cost. It comes at the cost of Jesus. He took our punishment. He took our old identity. How does scripture talk about who we are? were before we put our faith in Christ? What does the Bible say about our relationship to God apart from Christ? Can you think of some words that scripture says? 
enemies, dead. Not, not, not a good identity, correct? Not an identity that any of us want. But in Christ, that identity changes. We are sons and daughters. We are co-heirs. That's good. See, that is good. That is good language. But that, and that is ours, and it is secure. But think about the price that God paid in order for that to be true. And so think about when we run to other things to find our, our identity and our value and our worth. You know, it takes us all the way back to that Romans passage that we looked at, right? We're, we're, we're foolish in our thinking, right? If we would exchange what God gives us, the identity that he gives us in Jesus, we would exchange that to chase after all these other idols that just cannot satisfy. They cannot fill those, those, that void, that need in our life for, for meaning and for value and for significance. Only Jesus can do that. And he has done that in the gospel. So those are just some good just thoughts to go back and reflect on maybe over the next several weeks. You guys remember these questions from last week that we saw when we said, as we lay this foundation, there's four questions that we need to be thinking through. Who is God? What has God done? We covered those last week. This week, I told you we were gonna look at these last two, who am I in light of God's work and how should I live in light of who I am? That's kind of what we've been circling around this whole time, looking at this idea of identity is because of the truth of who he is, now I can look at who I am with clarity. And that's really important, guys. If, if, I don't, if, I'm not, if I don't clearly understand who God is and what he has done and what he has done for me, I'm never gonna be able to see myself correctly. And if I don't see myself correctly, and if my identity is not rooted in Christ, then every other relationship I have, every other pursuit I chase after in life is going to be set on a trajectory for failure and not success. Because I'm putting way too much pressure on those things to define me rather than resting in who I am in him. Does that make sense? what we're saying as we go through this. So there's four questions that I want us to look at here to kind of finish our time together that help us discern if we are really applying the gospel to every area of our lives, our understanding of who God is and our understanding of who we are. So those four questions, you've got them there in your notes. What am I doing or experiencing right now? Ask yourself that question. The answer to that question will help you discern if you're applying the gospel to your everyday life. How would you answer that question? What am I doing or experiencing in my life right now? In light of what I am doing or experiencing, what do I believe about myself? And we're gonna use these questions in just a minute, so we're just going over them here to, to kind of get us started. Number three, what do I believe God is doing or what do I believe God has done? And then the last one, what do I believe God is like? So just, just sit there for just a minute. Think about how right now, today, Wednesday night, you would, how would you answer each of those questions? You don't say it out loud, but just think. What am I doing or experiencing right now in light of what I'm doing? What do I believe about myself? What do I believe about what God is doing right now in my life? What do I believe about what God has done in my life? And ultimately, what do I believe God is like? Right? The way we answer those questions really starts to shine a light into how much we're applying the truth of God's word to, to our lives, the truth of, of the gospel, the good news of what Jesus has done to save us, to give us new life. How we answer these questions really helps us understand if that's something more than just knowledge that we have, and it's becoming an everyday reality 
to how we approach everything else that we do. And here's how I wanna show you that that is true. So we're gonna do an exercise here with these next two pages that you have using basically those, those four questions that, that I've given you there. So go ahead and look uh, with me. Go ahead and turn it where you've got page 16 and 17 in your handout so you can kind of see them both laying there side by side. Remember this phrase that we talked about last week, that the roots of our faith produce the fruit of our life? We, we, we talked about that a couple of times last week. I wanna show you how that really can play out and why, why these truths are so important to lay a foundation. This isn't just psychological talk. Like This is really important like application of God's word into our lives in order to see other things around us with clarity. This, this really starts to play out. I wanna show you how it does so. So taking those questions, all right? Using, using a tree, fruit tree. We've got an apple tree here. There's, there's fruit up at the top of this tree. This first page, so you've got it on page 16, Right, the one we're gonna look at and examine first, this is, let's say we're operating in our flesh. So we are not applying the gospel to our everyday lives, right? It is like, you know, you know, Jesus, yeah, yeah, I know I need him. I, you know, I know I needed, I needed to trust him as my savior. He saved me, I'm going to heaven but yet I've just gotta get on with life, right? And I've gotta figure that out by myself. Those two things have somehow become very detached for you and you're not applying the gospel to your everyday life. The Bible will say you're walking in your flesh. You're not living like who you are, your new identity as a follower of Jesus. You, you've detached your everyday life from that identity and you're trying to come up with and create another one in order to function every day. That is called living in our flesh. So what does that look like? Well, that one would start with the top, with the fruit. If that is true, we would say what we, we are being led by what we feel and what we experience. So we could start to throw some fruit up there, some of the things we feel and experience. We could throw some stuff up there. Maybe one of those is strife. Maybe one of those is stress being overwhelmed. Maybe one of those is exhausted. Maybe one of those is I feel unloved. I feel alone. I feel hopeless. You get the idea? Like if we're operating in our flesh, we're being led by our feelings. Those things are, are, are what are, are, are defining us. The fruit of our life can be all of these, these negative things Right, and that, that is because that, that's what's right in front of our faces, correct? Our circumstances. Would you agree? That's what we face every day. There's bills to pay. There's, you know, we've got children that, that you know, don't act the way we want them to all the time. We cannot train our spouse to do what we want them to do. If we could just get our spouses, right, to, to do what we want them to do, then finally there'd be some peace in our life, right? They're the source of my strife, right? We, we, can, we can have all that up there. When we're operating in the flesh, that is our starting point, is we're looking at that fruit and everything else. See the arrows going from the fruit? Which way are they going? They're going down. So everything goes from there down. Our feelings, right, based on our circumstances in our life, start to tell us who we are. Well, so if I'm alone, if I feel alone, then what does that tell me about who I am? You see how it, you see how it works? If, I, if I'm overwhelmed, then that feeling then, if I'm living in my flesh, starts to tell me something about who I am but it doesn't stop there. The arrows continue to go down, don't they? Then it starts to seep into telling me something about what God has done. Well, if this is who I am, then it doesn't stop there. There's something, there's something off in what God is doing in my life. 
But then it doesn't stop there. Then it starts to say, well, it's not just something off between my relationship with God. There, must, there may be, we start to question God's character entirely. Let me tell you a way like this could play out. And I'll give you, I'll give you a personal example of this. Remember how I told you one of my identity idols is people-pleasing, right? The approval of man is, is one of those things that it's so easy for me to chase after and look to for, to define me. Well, fruit that that can produce in my life is feeling like, you know, I, I'm scared, I'm anxious, I, I, get, I get stressed. Does that person like me? Did, did I say something wrong? Did I not do the right thing? Right? Did I not show up early enough? Did I not stay late enough? Did they not see me working hard enough? Right? I, I get consumed by all of that, and I can get anxious and stressed and overwhelmed and eventually just burned out and exhausted. Well, then that starts to tell me something about myself when that's true. It tells me that maybe I don't measure up. Maybe I'm not good enough. Maybe I've got to work harder in order to earn people's approval. And so I start to believe about myself that I'm never going to measure up. But it doesn't always stop there because at some point with those feelings, I eventually say, God, why have you left me in this place? Why, God, did you not make me good enough? Do you see how it can start to, to just trickle down? And eventually it can get to a place where it's like, well, God, do you not care? Do you not see me? Do you not know how hard I'm working to, to, to do all of this, to be all the right things to all the right people? Right? It, it's, it's subtle, but it can, it can have that, that effect where what we're experiencing in life ultimately starts to tell us what we, it starts to define what we believe about who God is when we're operating in the flesh. Now, do you think that's true in relationships? You think that happened? You think this creeps into relationships with spouses, even boyfriends and girlfriends? Like, you think it creeps into our relationships with our kids? Right, like if, if one of the things that you, you know, just a quick one, if the thing, one of the things that you find your identity in is, is looking like you've got it all together, you know, success, right? If your kids don't make you look successful, right, then, then that becomes, then you start to just put un, <laughs> unhealthy pressure on them, right? Because you've got to help, you've got to help define me. Right, because I need to be a winner and you've got to help me look that way. And so we put all this pressure sometimes on our spouse or on our kids to, def to help define us because ultimately we're not looking to Jesus for that. We're looking to another relationship to give us those things that only he can give us. So what should we do if this is where we find ourselves? is in this starting with here's my experiences and they have started to tell me who I am. They've started to tell me then about what God has done and they've ultimately started to define for me who God is. How do we flip that script? Repentance. If you're a child of God, if you're a follower of Jesus, right? the Bible says that if we will confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us, right? There is, there, is a, there, is a, there is a repentance. There is a change of direction that we can have, and that's exactly, that's why I wanted you to have the charts facing each other, because there is a change, of course, you see, we've got, if we will repent of the first one and start from the right direction, which way are the arrows moving on the right-hand side? They're moving up. So if we start with what the Bible says, and again, if you don't take anything else away tonight, that's the thing to take away, right? That the foundation we're gonna build everything on is the word of God. How do we learn about who God is? 
We learn it from his word. This is where he tells us, who he reveals himself to us in the pages of his word. And so if we will start with that, who is God? What does scripture tell me about who he is? And work our way up. And then what does scripture tell me about what God has done? Right? He who knew no sin became sin for us so that he could clothe us in his righteousness. God so loved the world that he gave his own son so that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. Right? We, could just, we could rattle off verse after verse that tells us about what God has done. And from that understanding, from applying that knowledge to our lives, that then tells us and informs our understanding of who we are. And now we're right back where we started with our identity, that a clear understanding of who we are that is actually based on who God is and what God has done then starts to produce fruit in our lives. That the Bible would say, is, that is walking in the spirit when we start from that direction, working our way up. And that is what helped me, more than anything, begin to get a handle on some of those areas where I told you that I struggled. When I finally started to understand that I was accepted, that I was valuable, that God loved me, that I did not have to earn it, that I did not have to chase after it to try to impress somebody to get my value, that God, in his love, in his grace, I could never earn it, but in his grace and in his love and in his mercy, loved me enough to die for me so that I could be accepted so that I could be clothed in his righteousness, not a performance-based thing that was conditional upon me, but it was secure in him. You know what that started to produce in my life instead of stress and anxiety and worry? Peace, contentment, assurance, confidence. Guess what? I still work as hard as I ever did. But you know what has changed? There's joy in it now, as opposed to feeling like a duty that I just had to do in order to get to be who I thought I needed to be. Right? The whole mentality has changed because I'm starting from the right direction, working up. As we start to get into some of these topics, that we're gonna look at over the next several weeks. I just want you to understand, I need to be reminded of this too, that having what we've looked at for these two weeks as our foundation to build on is actually going to help us in all of these other areas that we're going to cover. I believe the Holy Spirit's gonna bring us back to these truths to say, wait a minute, Maybe the tension over here, maybe the struggles I had over here started with a wrong belief about who God is. Maybe I was forgetting to apply the gospel to my everyday life. Maybe I forgot that I had been set free, that I had been forgiven, and I'm still carrying the weight and the shame of guilt around, and I don't need to because the gospel has set me free of that, and I can let that go, and now I can have healthy relationships here, or I don't have to put pressure on this relationship because God has already made me secure with that need in himself, right? There's so many ways that we can chase this, but we've gotta have that knowledge at our base to apply as we start to talk about these things. So hopefully this is helpful. Hopefully this gives you something over the next couple of weeks to begin to apply uh, to, to life. I know I've kept us way longer. Uh, well, not way longer, two minutes longer. That's not too bad. Um, I'm gonna let you guys go. Uh, let me pray us out of here. Uh, if you got kids to pick up, I know you gotta go do that. If not, you are welcome to sit around your tables and continue to talk and uh process through some of the stuff we've looked at tonight, uh, and I hope to see you back next week, okay? Uh, God, thank you for tonight. 
Thank you for this time that we've had. Uh, we give you praise, God, most of all, just for who you are and how because of you, God, we have an identity that is secure and a hope that can never fade. We thank you so much for the salvation that is ours in Jesus, and we pray in his name. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a good night.